Right now on Amplified, the Engineers Journal podcast, we're about to discover how two engineers are striving to keep us safe every single day. Um, somebody who's very curious, otherwise nosy. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm describing myself. Uh, since I was a kid, I always wanted to know how does that work? The underpinning for me would be somebody who is a problem solver. Somebody who can see an issue and find a workaround, find a way in which it can be made to work safely and cost effective. Hi there, my name is Dusty Rhodes and you're welcome to Amplified, the Engineers Journal podcast. Often, safety regulations only make the news when something has gone wrong. But what about all of the ways that they keep us safe? From trains to planes, construction sites to leisure centres, we're faced with an unlimited number of risks and hazards every day that are analysed and managed by the unsung heroes of safety. Today, we're going to find out how people in the field are consistently working and learning to protect us from harm and why strict regulations and codes are necessary to keep our infrastructure operating smoothly. To find out more about this, we're joined by two professionals who have excelled in the space of safety. From Foley Safety Solutions, we have a safety professional and experienced auditor who has worked across numerous industries and advised at government level on developing safety management systems for unregulated industries. Mary Foley, you're very welcome. Thank you so much, Dusty. Thank you. Also joining us is a chartered civil engineer and artist who works with Irish Rail and has a vision that aims to achieve global environmental sustainability. Regina Cleary, you're welcome. Thanks very much for having me, Dusty. We've got lots to talk today about safety, but before we do, can I just take a moment to ask you about engineering overall as an industry? Uh, Mary, I'll start with you because as a CEO, you'll have experience of this. When, whenever I'm speaking to CEOs on the podcast, they always have struggles with staff. Uh, and I bet without even saying what those struggles are, you can tell me what they are. <laughs> um, well, you've got, you've got it's tr- staff retention is a huge issue. The balance, the gender balance within that is is an issue. So, and then, you know, any uh, CEO in any company, you know, unless you've got a really, really strong HR department, you know, you've got a nightmare in your hands. And tell me more about the gender balance. Why, why, where does that sit in your head? Well, in my head, <laughs> um, no disrespect, present company excluded, <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> just, just in general. Um Women have really, really good follow through. You know, we develop a plan and we follow through on it. I also know that kind of their very, very, their attention to detail uh, in my experience has been much, much better. And I think in my industry specifically, that's so important. Uh, Attention to detail and follow through. I think I'd have to second that, Mary. Yeah. Yeah. I did a little bit of lecturing in Australia for four years and I had uh, Predominantly, I was teaching male students and maybe there might be three females in the class, but that attention to detail always stood out, particularly with the females in the class. And that work, not that the work ethic was terribly different, but definitely, like you said, you describe it as the follow through and the ability to communicate as well. We're already conditioned or expected to communicate well. So that probably underpins our attention to detail. And I know working with Irish Rail, they've put their hands up as well and acknowledged that there is a problem. There's a gap in that, that the gender, gender in the workplace. Um, they've acknowledged that there's 10% females working across Irish Rail. And they plan to at least double that by 2030 to try and fix that gender gap. And already, I think there's something around 56% of the intake of graduates into the company have been female this year. So they're already making that st- those steps, those waves to, to practically, not just for the sake of the profile of the company, but to actually make those steps to start making that change. And it's not an easy one to, uh, to, to change, um, but you have to f- physically allow or physically target those audiences, those particular schools, um, and to make, them, make girls and women, young women aware that you're actually hiring and to say that in your advertisement, in your marketing, to say that um, females and women are, are welcome to apply. So, Regina, uh, let me ask you then, how would you encourage women who are considering a, a career in engineering? What, what would be the carrot you'd dangle? 
Um, well, like that, I have that same experience when I was lecturing in Australia, in Perth. Um, there was a government-wide initiative there for the same thing to get more women into STEM roles in particular. So we realised with the research that we did that we had to go to the schools and not just to transition year leave insert that we'd have here, but to get them at a young age into the primary schools, into the first, second year of secondary schools and to present ourselves to come as women who are working in the science, the tech, the um, mathematical side of you know, the industries, the workplaces there that are predominantly held, the roles are held by men. So it just for, I suppose, you have, like that thing, to, to be it, you have to see it. And for, I started off in art college and in fashion design, and now I'm an engineer. Nobody could have told me at that stage in my life that I was going to be an engineer. I wouldn't have believed it if you told me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so moving from fashion design and holding on to that curiosity of design and process and how things are made. I, I was always interested in architecture and design and garments and that's the link uh, is how to create and fix problems and how to make it fit the people that you're designing for civil engineering and designing building infrastructure is the exact same thing in my mind as designing a garment or a dress or a pair of shoes and um, you have to make it fit and suit the people that you're designing for so yeah you have to get into the schools and get them at an early age to attract um, the women into these industries to show them that they can do this, that the women are already doing it, and also to promote and market it and use that particular language and be specific and invite women into the companies that are at the moment dominated by males or by men. Mary, uh, when you are recruiting, um, do you do anything in particular to encourage women to uh, consider a career in engineering? I don't, and I have to agree there with Regina, like we don't get enough apl applicants. Um, and I don't think um, women are, not, not women, but I don't think, you know, at school, when the kids are still in school, I don't think they're grasping kind of the, the variety of roles that engineering presents. Um, and Regina, your story is just the perfect example of that, that technically you're doing the same thing that you wanted to do when you were leaving CERP, but you're doing it in a different, with a different focus, so to speak. But it's still the same. It's still the same yeah. con concept, you know. Yeah, and you're right. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, mine is mine is the same. Like it's it's still taking it, and you can take safety engineering and bring it to literally any industry. Yeah, um, yeah. and the same rules will always apply. You know, the same risk yeah. management. Yeah. The concept is always going to be the same. Um, I mean, I when I do hire, I kind of I do pay a lot of attention to feedback that I'm getting from, you know, pre people they've worked with previously or with, you know, um, where they've had experience with say they've been, we do a lot of training, a lot of safety training, a lot of kind of consultancy work. So I would, testimonials are very important to me and, you know, feedback from previous experiences and so forth. And I don't think women are looking for, I mean, there's this concept out here, Regine, I'm sure you'll agree with this. As women, we're not looking for special treatment. No. We're not looking to only work mornings. No. We're not looking to have Fridays off, you know what I mean? We're perfectly prepared to work, you know, 50, 60 hours a week if needs be to get it right. Um, we're just as hard working and there's no special treatment. Yeah, required. just as resilient. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's really interesting because we're recording the podcast in the same month as International Women in Engineering Day. And... I think it's getting better to see more women in engineering. If you look at any engineering website now, they're all using stock photos of women and men on site and stuff like that. Uh, just to go back to your stock photos reference there a moment ago, Dusty, though, you know, it drives me absolutely nuts when I see some of these <laughs> stock photos. And they <laughs> perfectly manicured nails, you know, makeup like the just about the There is no woman on earth that looks like that on the building site. Uh, yeah, I can tell you, Mary, um, I especially in the last year, um, what feedback, I gave some feedback um, to, m to my own company, Tire Trail, and I advised to use the people who are already working in the company yeah. for those photographs, for marketing. So now um, I suppose I was already holding my hand up to be, <laughs> to take part. Of, and uh, so only recently I've had a photographer follow me in my everyday work and role. And I'm not, all, I'm in my orange high vis working on track. And um, we um, we attended the I Wish event in the RDS, which was about getting more young girls and women into STEM roles. 
and um, there was a, a poster bigger than myself of my of me in my high vis standing on a platform. And uh, like that, they've acknowledged what you just said, Mary, is that it's very important to make it look real uh, as it is. Um, we, we, we can, of course, go in with our nails painted if we so choose, but we're not like that every day. We're, we're there working and we have to wear, wear a PPE the same as everybody else. I have my hard hat on some of the days. And yes, you, you get stuck in just like everybody else. And you're not always going to come home the same way you left the house. You know, so yeah, <laughs> part of the message I'd like to give, you know, not to be should assume that women would be afraid to do these roles because um, we are well able to pick up the equipment and the tools and the shovels and do as men do, climb the ladders. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's no different. Yeah. Let's let's chat about safety. I think a lot of people underestimate the importance of safety. I mean, we seldom hear of things like, you know, bridge collapses. There was one huge one in Italy a couple of years ago. However, catastrophes, when things like that do make the headlines. Uh, Regina, I'm just thinking of yourself when I think of bridges and trains and, uh, and stuff like that. How would you balance that kind of bad news, if you like, with some everyday examples of consistent use of services that work seamlessly in safety? Every single day that I go to work, safety underpins what I do. Every single day before we even begin our work, we have our safety briefing, our method statements. We're all trained. We have we take a personal track safety course. That's the first ticket that you get to make sure that you know that you are responsible for your own safety. It takes it could take a train up to 800 to a kilometre and a half to stop a fast train. That's the level of risk. And that's important for the public to know, as it is for an employee working on the track. So your personal safety and the safety of the team you're working with is first and the most important thing that you have to have in your head before you start your work. And as you continue your work throughout the day and the objective is to get everybody home safely, not just to complete the work as prescribed, but to get everybody home safely, first and foremost. So when it comes to the actual infrastructure and the interface with the general public or members of the public, one of the things that um, we uh, monitor every day is, um, say, vehicles traveling under bridges. And often a vehicle might get stuck or what we might we call a, a bridge strike. And the most important thing that the member of the public can do in that instance is to use the phone number that's on the side of the bridge and contact us immediately and give the number of the bridge so that we have the location. And straight away, then we will send out a team to remove the vehicle if necessary uh, and help that member of public to do the right thing. And to also stop all trains that are, it, that's above that bridge and um, to make sure that the people, the passengers traveling on that train and that train, whether passengers are on it or not, is safe to continue on its journey or to stop it until it is safe to continue. So that's something that we monitor every every single day. Another thing, level crossing use. We have level crossing awareness day. And you'll see I'll be there, my high vis along with other members or colleagues of mine throughout the country. We'll be at certain level crossings where we want pedestrians to be more aware or vehicle users to be more aware of how to properly and safely use the level crossing. One of the things that we'll say is for, for pedestrians in particular, take out your earbuds. If you're listening to m- music, take out the earpods, take off the headphones. Beware of the wind and how sound is traveling. You need to listen for the horn of the train, or the movement of the train coming towards you, you to look in, up and down the track before you cross it. And stay at least two meters away from the nearest rail when the train has passed. And if there's barriers, if the barriers are going up, wait till they're up and wait till the f- the lights stop flashing. Some people tend to go when the barriers are up, but the lights are still flashing. So stop, wait for the lights to stop flashing for those extra moments and make sure it's safe to cross before you do. Keep your dogs in the lead. Be aware that your pram is in front of you. So make sure the pram is two meters away from the rail and not just you. And um, yeah, overall, just be aware of your surroundings. Wind, Wind down the window of the car if you're stopped in the car so that you can hear properly what's going down, turn off your radio and just simple things that people might, might not necessarily be common sense. Uh, Absolutely. Don't take it for granted. There isn't a train just because you can't see it. The hearing and to look a few times up and down before you cross and to not stop in the middle of the crossing either. Just keep going until you're at the far side of the crossing as well. 
So yeah, that's some. There are things that we are aware of that we have to manage along with our everyday maintenance work. Is the, at that interface with the members of the public. We want to mean to keep the railway safe for everybody, all users. So a lot of safety then is preventative measures and Absolutely. simple instructions yeah. to, to people. Yeah. And when you think it through, uh, Mary, how about industries outside of rail now uh, that are lacking in safety measures that could could do a little bit more of this thinking? Uh, how do you how do they identify potential hazards? Well, uh, hopefully this industry is kind of outside of the ones we've discussed would, you know, the the whole safety management system has to be based around risk assessment um, and, and the risk assessment has to be based on two formats. You've got the possibility of it occurring, whatever the risk might be, the risk realizing itself, we'll say, and then the severity of the outcome if it did happen. And generally speaking, uh, it'll be a near miss that will actually trigger them getting more help, bringing in somebody from outside to assist them. Sometimes it's too late. Sometimes it's after something has happened when somebody's lost a finger or the top of a finger or whatever it might be. But generally speaking, from my experience uh, as a professional, I'm generally being brought in after the stable door has been left open. And uh, a lot of my work will be, first of all, closing the stable door, making sure no other horses are going to get out. And then, you know, setting up the systems and procedures to make sure that there won't be any additional accidents, you know. And always, always when I get to a site, I find that it's not always the reason they rang me that I'm there for, that I will actually find maybe half a dozen different other reasons why I need to be there and things that need to be addressed, you know. The, the, the prevention is always better than cure. But unfortunately, people have this image, Dusty, that safety is expensive. It's not as expensive as a claim. And I mean, a claim isn't the be all and end all. It's the personal uh, injury, the pain, the loss, the suffering, the everything else, you know, the impact yeah, of someone's yeah. family. That's yeah. really what we're trying to prevent. It's not a claim. A claim is the easiest and cheapest part of it. Some people say, oh, I don't want to get a claim. That's not what you should be looking at. You should be looking, you know, looking after your people. Mary, if you're an engineer and, you know, part of your day is going to be thinking about safety, but how can you just change your mindset to kind of up your game when you're thinking about safety and preventing things from happening in the first place? What advice would you give an engineer? Uh, I would always say to um, look at the two kinds of risks. So look at the foreseeable ones, which are, you know, you would expect in you know, any business. And then you got the unforeseeable ones, the ones that I would call site specific. Um, and I would say to look at that and always, always, always respect the unexpected. You can never allow for things that people will do, you know, and I have invent, I have, you know, investigated so many accidents now across a number of industries, but um, one in particular just jumps to mind there um, where when we train somebody, to respond in a certain way and you train them and train them and train them and then they will respond exactly as you trained them. So sometimes you need to look at the training and say, okay, is this what I want them to do if this outcome occurs? Um, and what springs to mind is a particular case where I was investigating an accident. I would have had a happy ending. The casualty survived, but where we had a lifeguard jumping into the water, swimming across the pool, and then bringing the casualty the whole way back up the pool again before they took them out of the water to start resuscitating them. Do you know, because that's what we train them to do. So I think we need to maybe look at our training and say, okay, if this hazard realizes and the risk associated with that hazard realize, is the training that I've given them going to have the desired outcome? You know, so I would I would be looking at the foreseeable, the unforeseeable, and then looking at the training and saying, okay, if this happens, will that training uh, cover every eventuality? Well, can I ask then, how should an engineer think about these things? Because the environments that you're both working in, I mean, everything is constantly changing and evolving around us. I mean, how? I'll, I'll start with uh, Regina. How do you stay on top of new hazards and changing regulation? Well. Um, <laughs> Even just on, on a daily or uh, a few hours in that day um, where you, you set up your, I'm a track safety coordinator. It's another level of safety that I'm trained for, where I'm looking after a group of people who are working track side, like Mary mentioned earlier. Um, so one of the things you're looking out for 
as part of your training, you've you've set up um, a safe method statement, say a method statement for carrying out your work safely. And one of the things you're looking out for is if that changes, if the weather changes, for instance, if the underfoot conditions have changed, maybe there's more water all of a sudden than there had been when you first started. So I would have given my safety briefing before we came onto the site. So if that safety briefing would have been based on what I see on the the morning of or before work starts, um, safe access and egress from the site, that might change. Um, So if when we're doing our work or carrying out our work, any of those conditions change, then I would have to stop the works, take people aside and to rebrief according to the new conditions. So it's you're constantly as an engineer, not just carrying out the work, but you're also looking at your environment around you and you're monitoring those changes. You're looking at the people who are working in your group as well. You're looking for any signs of fatigue or dehydration, things like that, that you might think as part of an engineering role. But you're, all, you're keeping an eye on everything as best that you can, along with other colleagues that you have in safety roles alongside you. There's levels of safety within that um, safe system of work is the term I was looking for earlier. Um, so there's levels of safety within that safe system of work. And there's more than just me as a track safety coordinator. We've other engineers in positions of safety as well. And everybody um, acknowledges that they are responsible for their own um, safety as well. They all have their PTS and they all have their, they all sign off for that before they've come to site. So yeah, it's constant monitoring and you have to maintain your currency. Whether you're an engineer or a chartered engineer, you have to maintain your currency and make sure that you're up to date. It's not enough to take um, a once off safety training course. You have to do that repetitively. And you, it's, it's unlike that, you'll train somebody to do something once but to train them over and over again so that they automatically do what they're trained to do. I was in the Reserve Defence Forces for 11 years, and one of the things that I took away from that was that repetitive training, training again and again and again so that when something happens straight away, you just switch on and you do the right thing, the right thing being the thing that you were trained to do. If I could jump in there, actually, if you don't mind, uh, Regina, because you raise a very interesting point there. Um, and that's, you know, the need. People sometimes say, oh, safety, that's that's her job. It's not. Safety is absolutely everybody's role. Absolutely everybody. And um, we don't have to train them realistically in, in safety because we all do it automatically. We all get into the car in the morning and we risk assess the driveway onto the main road to see, you know, um, whether or not I can pull out here, it's safe to pull out or not. So we're always risk assessing in our lives all the time. So most people, it comes second nature to them. But the point of work, the dynamic point of work risk assessment is really, really, really important skill. The ability to be able to recognize the conditions have changed and to be able to do this dynamic risk assessment, albeit in your head and say, okay, now it's unsafe. We need to stop what we're doing. You know, so I think I think safety, it needs to be kind of across the board. And just going back to your question there, um, Dusty, I suppose IOSH have been incredible. Engineers Ireland, incredible in terms of providing us with kind of a continuing professional development and new stuff coming down the track, new information. And yeah, we absolutely have to stay on top of it all the time because it's ever moving, ever changing and thankfully ever improving. There's a huge drive at the moment, particularly with the sustainable development goals. Um, I'm on the committee for the um, for setting up the forums with the Department of Envi- Environment for the sustainable sustainable development goals, which there are 17 of. And goal three is um, good health and well-being, and future work and health and safety in the workplace comes under that goal. And working towards that, a lot of companies now they should work towards becoming an SDG champion, which Irish Rail now is. But all of that maintaining safety in the workplace. And the well-being of employees, having well-being programs and even gender equality, all those things make your workplace safer. So all of, like Mary said, Engineers Ireland, all those governing bodies, Department of Environment and Communications are, have that information there and guidance there to help workplaces get this going or to be more focused on reporting it and how they're progressing along the way. So the information is there. And I suppose to make time 
to acknowledge these initiatives there is important, as well as your day to day work as an engineer. Um, I do it. A lot of that work I do it as part of being a chartered engineer outside of my day to day work. I do it as voluntary work um, to, um, I suppose, share the knowledge of the SDGs and health and well-being and um, code of ethics and yeah, any regulations that have changed. Yeah. Um, but seeing as you brought it up, Regina, uh, about sustainability, what changes would you like to see in the engineering sector specifically to ensure sustainability and longevity? Specifically, I'll bring it back to basics. Um, when we're talking about longe- longevity, and I've already mentioned gender, and we, we started the conversation very early on with um, mentioning um, the gender gap, and particularly with PPE, professional protective equipment, Changes need to be made and acknowledged that women, the female body needs a particular sizing to comfortably wear the PPE that's there available. There's no such thing really as unisex PPE, especially when it comes to protective equipment. In my role, I'm crouching down, I'm climbing ladders, I'm up and down embankments and bridges. My PPE needs to be safe for me to wear and comfortable for me to wear and to carry out my job safely. So I think a lot of workplaces um, are starting to acknowledge this, um, that there is a difference, especially in footwear as well, between male and female footwear. So for the, even to retain the women who are, re- are working in engineering roles, we need to see those changes made sooner the better so that we feel comfortable and welcome in the jobs that we're in. And simple things, bring it back to the basics, that PPE, access to toileting facilities that are suitable for the female body, simple things like that will promote more women in the industry, in the engineering industry, and also for the longevity of the industry and to get more women involved in engineering. It doesn't, it's not going to take a lot of thinking, only to acknowledge what's already there that we need to change. Yeah. And they're small things. Um, Yeah. On sustainability, Mary, and away from safety, uh, talk to me about cultured meat. Uh, the, the you know where it's, uh, meat is grown in a in a lab, but that's of a particular interest to you, isn't it? It is, it is, um, and that was one that I came across while working with uh, ABEC, a company, an American company. There, they're based up in Formoy. It was there that I came across it, but it's actually quite a, a, you know advanced in terms of the the research. In that meat can be grown in a bioreactor from literally only a few cells, and. To me, the obvious the obvious use of that would be to to provide food and nutrition and a high protein dense product to the starving millions in the world. And I suppose it breaks my heart to a certain extent that um, where that uh, research and where all that effort is going is more to providing for you know multinational companies so they can offer a meat free burger. Now, it was fascinating to me for, for even from the, the outset, it's um, you can roughly kind of generate about 500 pounds of uh, protein meat in the bioreactor in a day. But what ABEC were trying to do um, in tandem with a company called Good Meats in the US was to size it up to actually build bioreactors big enough to be able to scale it to the point where it was possible to literally feed the world you know, where we would have, you know, the capacity to generate huge amounts of this product. But to me, you know, guys, sorry, if we're if we're if we're developing products like this, which would be absolutely life changing for people, we really need to be drilling that and focusing it down to the areas which need it most, not kind of offering new products to already overfed uh, Europeans and Americans. It sounds like an enormous job to be kind of growing these things in, in in a lab compared to, you know, kind of doing it the natural way, if you like. What's the difference in cost? Is there a huge cost saving doing it that way? There is a huge time saving uh, element to it. There is the, the fact that, you know, you're not having to slaughter, you know, thousands of animals and millions of animals. And I suppose you've got, you know, those animals while they're still, you know, being, you know, fed and watered and everything, there's, you've got your greenhouse gases and so forth that, um, that is being, you know, as, as a result of the cattle. So, I mean, it, the, the, the knock-on effect is huge, but it, the main thing is that if they can scale it up to the level that they were trying to scale it to um, and get it as automated as they were, yes, as they were making it to be, that we would have the capacity as a as a as a world to to be able to generate food to feed the whole world 
you know, in terms of kind of proteins, high, high dense protein. It's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting concept. I wasn't aware of Mary. And I, I, I suppose I'm not an all or nothing kind of person. I like to mix different systems into one and not just rely on a particular system. So we, I suppose it would be interesting to see that implemented. And when I hear you scale up straight away, I'm going back to, I have a master's in sustainable energy. I'm going right scaling up and I'm looking at life cycle analysis. And you mentioned carbon emissions and things like that. And as a civil engineer, I'm thinking of the amount of energy that you'd put into something like that versus is it going to uh, reach a, a net zero kind of at the end? Do you know, when you're talking about electricity, how it's generated and um, what are the materials we're using to create, build these plants? And then, yes, we're not slaughtering the animals, but there is going to be some kind of emission coming from the plant itself in helping that material to grow, the, the, the non-meat or meat to grow. And I suppose, and then I'm thinking of, yeah, there's some, uh, we're talking about biodiversity. Some systems rely on animals on the land as well for the sake of biodiversity. So it's a huge system, the life cycle of that system. Where does it end? Killed, cradled, gate, they call it. How 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 sure are we that it's a good thing and doesn't have bad side effects? But surely we can certainly improve the systems that we already have. But I don't think there's any quick fix. But, cer- but certainly, like you said, to continue to feed the people who already have the food doesn't work. And as it is, um, you know, a lot of the, the staple foods that um, are grown in South America are being shipped over to the Europeans and increase the cost of the staples that the South Americans might have otherwise for the sake of veganism. They're all the very interesting conversations, um, but increase emissions at the same time. So, you know, environment versus feeding the few, or I don't know, it's hard to be uh, sure of the outcome, whether it's a positive or a negative. Well, you see, these are the big questions that engineers typically tackle and yeah. talk out and stuff we like that. I find, I find <laughs> it fascinating. Yeah, Mary, any, any last point you'd like to make? One thing that we've we've kind of touched around but not kind of hit hit the nail on the head with is that very few employees and Regina, you you'll have found this as well, very few employees realize that under the two thousand and five Act they actually have an obligation to look after their own safety and the safety of others. And I know the trackside safety course focuses very heavily on that, but very few employees realize that they have a legal obligation. Yeah to look after their own safety and the safety of others. So I suppose if I was if I was sending any message out anywhere, that would be one of them, you know, to, to do look out for yourself and the safety of yourself and your colleagues. That's really, really important. It's been absolutely fascinating talking to both of you today. And we've gone down avenues that I never expected and you've brought things into my mind <laughs> that I never expected. But oh, really, really good stuff. So uh, I just want to say Mary Foley and Regina Cleary, thank you so much for joining us on the Engineers Ireland podcast. Thank you, Dusty. Thanks for having us. If you would like to find out more about Mary and Regina and some of the topics which we spoke about today, you'll find notes and link details in the show notes area on your player right now. And of course, you'll find more information and exclusive advanced episodes of the Engineers Ireland Amplified podcast on our website at engineersireland.ie. Our podcast today was produced by dustpod.io for Engineers Ireland. If you would like more episodes, do click the follow button on your podcast player to get access to all of our past and our future shows automatically. Until next time, from myself, Dusty Rhodes, thank you for listening.